I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Lazy. Why do you feel lazy? I guess I ate too much for Thanksgiving. Well, you certainly did. I thought you'd have turkey popping out of your ears the way you gobbled. <laughs> and I thought you would turn out to be a gobbler, like a turkey. Because I gobbled <laughs> like a gobbler? Oh, that's funny. Gobbled the gobbler. <laughs> oh, oh, I just thought of a little rhyme. Well, let's hear it. Turkeys gobble, ducks swaddle. If you think they don't, it's a lot of twaddle. Why, that's a very huh? good little rhyme. Oh, thank you. Now will you please read me the funny? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Yeah. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And at the top of the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. <laughs> Hoppy has discovered that someone has been smuggling guns to the Indians, thus providing them with weapons to go on the warpath. In an attempt to find out who is getting the rifles to the Indians... Hoppy, California, and Lucky have come to Pike's Landing, a river town where the trail has led them. As they check the feed stores for clues, they realize they're being followed. Hoppy stops suddenly, last picture top row, and says to the man behind, Hey, just a minute. My friends and I don't like being trailed. The stranger reaches for his gun, saying, And we don't like nosy strangers. Hoppy swings with the stranger, first picture next row, knocking him down. Two other men appear and make a run for Hoppy. Lucky grabs some pails and pants from in front of the store and throws them at the men, tripping them up. Seizing their opportunity, Hoppy and his pals dash down the street. They duck into an alley, hoping to lose their pursuers. But at the other end of the alley, fourth picture, second row, they see a gate, and behind it, longhorn cattle and more men. One of the men shouts, There they are! Stampede that beef! The gate swung open, and the men drive the cattle in. Hoppy and his pals reach up and grab the rafters over themselves. Last picture, middle row. The cattle ran underneath them. First picture, bottom row. They drop on the backs of the cattle and hang on as the cattle stampede down the street. As they pass a building, Hoppy yells, Hey, jump! Take cover in the riverboat freight office! Quickly, they dash into the freight office and then stop suddenly. For a last picture, a man behind the desk is pointing a gun at him. Lucky exclaims, Hey, who are you? The man replies, You might call me a gun collector. I'll begin with yours, gentlemen. My goodness, it looks like everybody in that town is against Hoppy and his friends. Yeah, it looks like he walked into a nest of trouble. Yes, and after all that trouble trying to escape, why they, then they go into a place where a man holds them up with the gun. Yeah, things don't look very good, but maybe next week Hoppy will think of a way to get out of this. Oh, I hope so. Now? Oh, now let's go over the page. Because I just know that on page three, we're going to try to find Prince Valiant. And I'm going over to page three because I just know that you're right. All right. There. See? I am. Yes, you are. So here we go with Prince Valiant and the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Gray, Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Prince Valiant had returned home, carrying a message from his friend, Sir Gawain, who lives across the channel. Gawain had suggested that King Aguar, Val's father, sign a treaty agreeing that all ships that travel through the waters between their two islands would be guaranteed safe passage. This agreement meant that they would be friends, no longer enemies, and that the people of one island would not plunder the ships belonging to the people of the other. But the very first merchant ship to sail through this route has been plundered by Boltar, the sea king who belongs to King Aguar's kingdom. Boltar has been arrested and brought before the king. The king is furious when he learns that someone from his country has broken the treaty. And in order to show Sir Gawain that he wants the treaty to be kept, the king decides to sentence Boltar. And Boltar is locked up like a prisoner. Last picture, top row. 
Like an angry walrus, Boltar paces the guarded chamber where he awaits sentence. In the middle of the night, Boltar is aroused from a troubled sleep by a tapping on the shutters. First picture, next row. He goes to the window, opens the shutters, and there, dark against the first gray of dawn, he sees a swaying rope. He climbs on the windowsill and sees that the rope leads to the top of the terrace wall. He looks down. Below him, the foaming river swirls. So quickly, he goes up, hand over hand. A moment later, he reaches the top, throws his leg over the terrace wall, and there stops. For he sees, last picture, second row, that his rescuer is that strange, dark, silent woman from across the unknown sea, Tilikum. She beckons to him and walks toward the steps leading down to the moat. Boltar quickly follows. First picture, bottom row, quietly as any shadow. She leads him down a flight of steps to where a boat tugs restlessly at its moorings. Boltar stops beside the boat, then looks at her. The last time they met, the woman threatened to kill him. Now she risks the anger of the king to set him free. Long he looks into the fierce dark eyes that seem to burn into his. And then... Last picture, Boltar has sculled the craft out into the current and goes plunging down through the spray toward the sea. And lying on the bottom of his boat is a bundle wrapped in a cloak and securely bound. Oh, he has a scarf and she helped him to do it. That's right. She must be in love with him. I think you've hit upon a fundamental fact. Yes, I think I have. But I wonder what the bundle in the boat is. Well, that's something to look forward to finding out next week, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. Uh Uh-huh. Now, what would you like to see? Well, now, could we find out what happens in Dick's adventures? Because you remember he was fighting the the Tripoli pirates, and and they licked him good last week. I wonder what'll happen next. Well, let's look at Dick's adventures and find out. So over the page we go, past Snuffy Smith, over the page, past Perry Mason and the Lone Ranger, turn over the page, and there on page six is Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggity pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick, who has been awakened by his exciting dream of the Tripoli Pirates, snuggles into the pillow again, and in a second is drifting off to dreamland once more. In his dream, he finds himself, last picture, top row, in a bustling fur trading post on the banks of the Mississippi. The year is still 1804. The post is St. Louis. As he moves to the edge of the post, first picture, second row, he stops. While watching a ceremony is a crowd of French, Spaniards, Indians, and Americans. Dick sees a French officer hand a document to an American officer. As the ceremonies end, Dick walks off with a young American officer who has been standing beside him. The officer says, Well, all the Louisiana territory is ours now, Dick. From New Orleans, north to Canada, and west from the Mississippi, halfway to the Pacific. We're growing big, big. He continues, last picture, second row. Ah, think of it, Dick. No one has ever crossed over land, over our land, from the Mississippi to the Pacific. We feel honored that President Jefferson has asked us to be the first to try. First picture, bottom row, they stroll along, talking about the purchase of the Louisiana Territory by President Jefferson. Now, this means that the middle of the United States, which had been previously owned by the French, has been bought by the Americans. While they are talking, first picture, bottom row, they reach a camp a few miles outside St. Louis where men are loading supplies aboard a river craft. Another officer approaches and greets Dick's companion. He says, Well, we're about ready to start, man, with her. First warm day in spring. The two men walk off, last picture, talking earnestly. Dick stares in awe and then exclaims, Merriweather? That's Captain Merriweather Lewis and Captain William Clark. Captain Clark. Oh, Lewis and Clark were two very famous pioneers who opened up a trail through the Northwest. Where's that? Where the mountains are? That's right, way out as far as the Rocky Mountains. And they had a wonderfully adventurous journey down the rivers, over the wild mountains, through Indian country. Indian country? 
Millions. Oh, that sounds like it'd be very exciting. Oh, it is. I'm certainly anxious to see that. Well, I think we'll see the beginning of that next week. Now, look, here's Rusty Riley below Dick's Adventures. Oh, yes. And you remember last week, Mr. Miles got a letter from a friend saying that he was going to send his adopted child, and uh, her name is Vivian, uh, so Mr. Miles could take care of her because her father was sick. That's right. And last week, a car came whizzing down the road at 90 miles an hour. And then the motorcycle cop arrested the driver, and that driver turned out to be Vivian, who's on her way to Mr. Mouse Place. Yes, so let's read now and find out more about this little speedster. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Mr. Miles, owner of Milestone Farm, is saying to Tex, Oh, uh, get the car out, will you, Tex? We've got to go to the police station. Looks like I've got plenty on my hands with Longhorn's youngster, Vivian. She's been arrested for speeding. Tex replies, Speeding? Well, then she ain't no baby. Okay, boss, I'll be right with you. A little later, Mr. Miles is saying to his daughter, Oh, uh, Patty, uh, Tex and I are going to meet our guest, Vivian Smith. You help Hannah to get the guest room ready for her. First picture, bottom row, later at the police station, Mr. Miles approaches the sergeant's desk and says, oh, Good afternoon, officer. I am Quentin Miles. I had a call from here about a girl, uh, Vivian Smith. The sergeant answers, A girl, is it? <laughs> well, if that one man right is a girl, I'm short up on the joints. Hey, Connors, bring that kid in here, will you? The officer named Connors opens the door, and out walks a saucy-faced young boy. He stops in front of Mr. Miles and says, Oh, it's here, old man Miles. Hiya. I'm Vivian Smith. Mr. Miles takes off his hat. Tex exclaims, Well, I'll be a sidewinder. It ain't no female girl. He's a boy. Yeah, it's that trick name again. I sure don't thank my folks for hanging that name Vivian on me. Well, come on. Tell these hick cops where they get off and let's scram. Mr. Miles turns, shaking his head, and says to the officer, Oh, uh, Sergeant, may I speak to you in private? Now, look, Mr. Miles, if you're going to ask me to forget this, I can't. We got orders to bring all speeders to court. No, no, I'm not asking that. I just want you to release him in my custody. I'll produce him in court. <laughs> Meanwhile, last picture in a town about 50 miles west. A burly man thumbs through a catalog on racehorse owners, and he exclaims, Hey, Nobby, uh, that kid with the hot rod that we met in the hotel yesterday, uh, didn't he say he was going to stay at Milestone Farm in Kentucky? Nobby replies, He did, sir, and I see by the glint in your eyes, Sir Percival, that it has given you an idea. <laughs> Well, I have a hunch it won't be a good idea. I have a hunch, too. And I don't like the looks of that Vivian or the way he talks. He's too smart, Alex. Yes, he is. I hope he doesn't get Rusty into trouble like the other boy did. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. Oh, and here they are on the first page of the second section. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. <laughs> Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafu, ramafum, zim, zem, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Okay, I'll raise. Dagwood and his neighbor, Herb Woodley, are downtown playing a game of cards with some of their friends. The phone rings, and Herb answers it. And he hears... Herb says, uh, yes, yes, dear. Uh, yes, dear. He ha turns to Dagwood and says, it was our wives, Dagwood. We got to go home. Dagwood drops his cards and poker chips, runs for his coat, puts it on, and dashes out the door with Herb. They stand on the corner, last picture top row. Herb says, I'm broke, Dagwood. You got bus fare for us? Dagwood reaches in his pocket and pulls out a couple of coins, saying, I just got two dimes. Oops, there goes one. Catch it quick. And he sees the coin drop through a grating on the sidewalk and disappear from sight. First picture next row, Dagwood exclaims, Hey, it rolled down the grating. Hey, we gotta get it, Herb. He kneels down and sticks his arm through the grating. Herb notices the building they're standing in front of and exclaims, Hey, gosh, this is a bank. Be careful. 
And then the burglar alarm goes off. Herb grabs Dagwood, saying, Hey, quick, that's a burglar alarm. He gives Dagwood's arm a pull. Dagwood yells, My arm's caught in the grating. Herb tugs and tugs, but Dagwood's arm won't come loose. And then suddenly, they hear police cars, motorcycle cops, and detectives heading for the bank. Herb yells, last picture, second row. Hey, I'm getting out of here. Good luck, Dagwood. And he runs off. Dagwood yells, Help me, Herb! Don't desert your pal! But Herb deserts his pal. And a moment later... There he is, right there! Come on, get him from there, right? Get him! Put the guns on him! That's the one! Dagwood is surrounded. Middle picture, third row. And as he lies on the sidewalk, his arms sticking through the grating, he stares at the cops with a look of, I'm innocent! I'm innocent! Last picture, third row, he is down at the police station. The huge grate still stuck on his arm. And he exclaims, what's happened to the officer? The officer says, well, I'll let you go. I understand. I'm a married man myself. Well, thanks, Captain. I promise to return the grating when I get it off. First picture, bottom row, Dagwood arrives home. The grate's still on his arm. He can't get his arm in his pocket to get the key, so he has to ring the doorbell. And a second later, the door is yanked open. Dagwood, tears in his eyes, says, It's me, dear. Where have you been? Herb Woodley's been home for hours. Dagwood staggers in the house. Blondie closes the door. Dagwood says, I gotta get this off. A half hour later, Blondie hangs up the phone and says... I've phoned every place I know of, and they all say that you will have to wait until morning, and that's that. Upstairs they go. Blondie in her nighty snuggles into bed. Dagwood, with his clothes on and his arms still stuck through the grating, climbs in beside her. He tries lying on his side. But it won't work. He tries lying on his stomach. Ouch! Ouch, Dagwood! So he has to lie there with the grating on top of him. And he growls, Wait till I get that guy, Woodley! (laughs) (laughs) Doesn't he look funny lying in bed with that big, big grating on his arm? He certainly does. (laughs) Poor fellow having to sleep with his clothes on. I don't blame him for being angry at Woodley. He wasn't a good pal. He left a friend in need. Indeed he did. And that's bad. That's bad. But look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, and that's good. You bet that's good, because this is an exciting adventure. But what happened to Roy last week? That was bad. That's right, it was bad, because Roy and his friend were about to escape from the mine. Yes, and Roy had climbed up a ladder and opened a sort of a trap door in the floor, and as he climbed through, that man Carp Mallory hit him on the head with a poker. And I'm just afraid that Roy will be almost killed. Well, let's read that right now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip yo Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip yo As Roy lies on the floor unconscious from the blow on his head, Carp Mallory tosses a lighted kerosene lantern on the floor. The dry wood bursts into flame. Mallory snarls. Ah, you and your pals are tough hombres to kill, Rogers. Maybe burning kerosene will do what dynamite in the mine shaft didn't do. Under the trap door in the cellar below, Jack Spratt calls. Hey, Roy, what's up? The trap door won't open. Let us out. See, in the cabin is well on fire. Mallory walks to the door, saying, The boss will be glad to know a tunnel connects Blot Kramer's mine to this shack. We'll use it ourselves after you birds are fried. As Mallory stops in the doorway and looks back once more, third picture, Norton, a short distance away from the cabin, draws a gun, saying to himself, With Rogers, Kramer, and Spratt buried in the mine, there's only one more to take care of. My friend, Carp Mallory. But his aim is bad. Norton only wounds Mallory in the shoulder. Mallory rushes inside the cabin again and slams the door shut. He opens the trap door, and Lot Kramer and Jack Spratt climb up. First picture, bottom roll. Roy, who has just regained consciousness, moans, Hey, what hit me? Mallory replies, I did, Rogers. Climb out, you hombres, and help douse this fire. Lot Kramer says in surprise, Well, how come, Carp Mallory? Don't you want me dead so you and Norton can grab my mine, Holdens? No, oh, I've been double-crossed. Norton tried to dry gulch me. Blot Kramer quickly seizes a pail of water, throws it on the flame. As Jack Spratt takes a blanket and starts to beat the flames out, Roy, who has gone to the window, sees Norton approaching the cabin, and he says, Hey, he's coming to make sure you're finished, Carp. Sprawl on the floor and play dead. You others get out the back door quick. 
Quickly, Roy steps behind the door as Blot Kramer and Jack Spratt duck out. Mallory lies on the floor pretending to be dead. Norton, who can't understand why the smoke should be pouring out of the cabin, opens the door and steps in last picture. He sees Mallory lying on the floor and aiming his gun, he exclaims, Looks like he's done for. But I've got to make sure. That's something we'll have to find out next week. And another thing, that cabin is still burning on fire, and nobody's trying to stop it from burning up now because they're hiding. I'm afraid they might be burned. That's something else we'll find out next week. Oh, this is so exciting, I can hardly wait. I know, I know, and I know you can hardly wait for Flash Gordon. Oh, yes. Turn over the page quick, and let's see if we find him. All right, over the page we go to see what we find. All right. There he is. Yes, sir. See? Remember last week, Flash had gone to the planet Mars and had captured the queen who wanted to make him a slave prisoner. Yes, and when they were escaping, they were overtaken by a sand blizzard which completely buried their car. And the sand froze over them so that they're just like they're in a, an icy cave. I don't see how they'll ever escape. Well, let's read right now and find out if they do. Here we go with Flash Gordon. riga riga doon doon sash Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Buried alive by an icy sand blizzard, Flash works frantically to dig a tunnel from the trapped sand car to the surface of the desert. But his haughty prisoner, Queen Menta, is impatient. She orders Flash to tell her their location so she can send a thought wave to her slaves to come and rescue them. But Flash has no intention of again becoming Menta's prisoner. And he tells her, I'd rather die free than live as your slave. We came here to offer you peace with Earth. Your pirates failed to conquer us, and you'll fail too. The queen gasps. Pirates. Suddenly, the truth dawns on Menta. She switches on the sand car's thought screener, last picture, top row. Flat recognizes Menta's mind picture as his old foe, Toxo, the pirate raider. Menta laughs bitterly and tells Flash that they are space exiles who must have headed for Earth when she banished them. Flash says, Well, enough idle talk. Right now, our job's to get out of this tomb. The first picture, bottom row, with Link's aid, he swings the sand car's engine around so that it exhausts points toward the surface of the desert. And then he warns, now this is going to be dangerous, but it's our only chance. Then last picture, when all is ready, Flash throws the starting lever. And instantly, a searing blast of white hot flame roars upward, melting a hole through the rock-like frozen drifts. And then suddenly, Dale sees a spot of daylight above, and they know that ahead lies the way out. Yes, but where will they escape, too? They have no car to travel in now. They'll have to travel on foot. Oh, yes. And maybe by now, everybody's discovered that the queen's been captured. Yes. Now, this means that next week, we might have a very exciting development. Oh, I can hardly wait. But I know I'll have to. Yes, I'm afraid you'll have to. But now, look, across the page. Oh, Alice in Wonderland. Yes, Alice in Wonderland. And remember last week, Alice had been following the little white rabbit again. And she got lost in the wood. And all kinds of crazy animals appeared from all sides. And Alice was so unhappy that she sat down on a log and began to cry because she thought she'd never get out. And then... And then the Cheshire Cat appeared again. I wonder if he will help us. Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Alice in Wonderland. Say the magic words with me. And And now now for a story story that gets gets curiouser and curiouser. curiouser. Alice Alice in Wonderland. So music, music, sir. Music, music, sir. As Alice sits on a rock, broken-hearted because she's lost, she hears a sound in the tree above. Hello. She looks up to discover the Cheshire Cat. She jumps to her feet and tells him she's lost, that she can't find her way. The Cheshire Cat smiles and answers, Naturally. You have no way. And he goes on second picture. You see, always in Wonderland are the Queen's ways. And Alice wishes she could meet the queen. And magically, third picture, the tree opens. And Alice sees a path leading to a castle beyond. She follows the path into the queen's garden. And suddenly she hears... Alice peers around a tall hedge. 
and she sees three cards skipping around, having a royal time painting the white rose bushes red. Alice watches in amazement as the three cards splash away with their paint singing. At that moment, trumpets blare. And there comes the sound of marching feet. First picture, bottom row. The three cards stop painting and exclaim in horror. The queen! The queen! The queen! The queen's army parades toward them. And then stops. The white rabbit appears and announces, Her Imperial Highness, Her Excellency, Her Royal Majesty. And pointing toward a huge, ugly-looking female, he shouts, The Queen of Hearts! And third picture, bottom row, behind her, a tiny little man sticks his head around her skirt and says weakly, And the king. Suddenly, a thundercloud crosses the queen's face. She holds up her hand, and as everyone trembles, the queen roars, last picture, Who's been painting my roses red? Yes, indeed. And mean. And ugly. Yes. I know there's going to be trouble now. Yes, I'm afraid so, because that queen has a very ugly look on her face. Yes. But we'll find out next week who gets into trouble with her. Oh, I just love Alice in Wonderland, though, because such interesting and quaint things happen. Yes, so do I. Such interesting things. Didn't you love those three mad cards? <laughs> yes. Well, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Honey and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.